This is an interview we're having with Bernice Johnson and Helen Lovell on May 18, 1998. We're going to start out by each one of them giving us a little brief history of themselves. And Bernice has some, some things she's written down she wants to share with us. Well, I'm just, I started to write my memoirs, and this is the beginning of them. I'll just give a preview of the family as such. Margaret Craven, in Again Calls the Owl, says, Richard Hooker wrote well of the reason people spend their lives learning to write, though for no other cause yet for this, that posterity may know we have not loosely, through silence, permitted things to pass away, as in a dream. Two, because of this, I am trying to put into words what my life has been like. <clears throat> Once upon a time, when the world was young, a baby girl was born to a loving couple who lived on a hilltop overlooking the green hills of the state of Vermont. From this Cornish, New Hampshire hill, called Dingleton since time began, one can see the mountain peaks of Pico and Killington, located near Rutland on the west side of Vermont, plus the ridges of all the mountains and hills in between. It is a fabulous view. This hilltop farm was obtained about the year 1760 from a King's Grant by a couple of men by the name of Fitch, called Samuel, born in 1757, and Hezekiah, born in 1746, sons of James, born in 1712. They had rowed up the Connecticut River from the state of Connecticut, their ancestors having sailed there from England in the 1400s. When they got as far north as where we live today, they got acres of these green-covered granite hills of New Hampshire in what had newly become the six-mile square area called Cornish. This township was settled way back in the year 1763 and officially founded in the year 1768. A log cabin was built near the northwest section in which the Fitch family lived for about three years. Then lumber was sawed from trees cut down on this land, and when dried, my ambitious ancestor, Hezekiah, built a house so sturdy and strong it still is there today. Nine generations of this original Fitch family have grown up in that loving home, and at this writing, a Fitch, named after the original James Fitch, lives there with his wife and three children. Okay, we're all descended from these pitches. So Helen, you give your early information. Well, I was born in Claremont, the second daughter of Byron Livingston and Bernice Fitch Livingston. The Bernice Amy Fitch, to differentiate it from the Bernice Fitch Johnson that is talking with me now, for whom, who was named for my mother. Turn it off for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> with my birth, the, that meant two girls, and then five years later, a son was born to this couple. And the following year, the mother died. Ernest died of the flu epidemic, actually of pneumonia, in 1920. Then uh, Grandma was there, as Grandma Ida Fitch, was there with us when my mother died and stayed for two and a half years until my father married again. So we grew up there, went to the Claremont schools, I graduated from Stevens in 1932, tried some things that didn't work, and worked for a number of years, and then went to a school in New York City, to the New York Training School for Deaconesses and other church workers. And from there, spent a year in the missions in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Okay. Uh, after going to New York and spending the year in Virginia, I came back to Hartford. I did a little nursing, and then um, I couldn't stand 
20-hour duty with no chance to interact with anybody except my patient and the family, I uh, went to work in Royal Typewriter. And there I met my husband. And we were working there at the time of Pearl Harbor. And all the girls in the factory were laid off the week after Pearl Harbor. And then they kept on a few of the men to finish the machines were almost done. And Rodney was one of them that stayed on until about the 1st of April. We were married the uh, 26th of April in Killingworth, Connecticut, by the Reverend Dr. George Gilbert, who had written 40 Years a Country Preacher, which is the sequel to 40 Years a Country Doctor and 40 Years a Country Lawyer. Uh -huh. He, he was a very fascinating person, and people came from all over the world to hear him and see him. We uh, lived in Hartford uh, for a couple of years, and then uh, Rodney's mother came to live with us because she was not able to live alone any longer and eat like she should and that sort of thing. So she was with us for seven years. And uh, during that time, we moved to Manchester, Connecticut. And well, actually, my third son was born there because I had two born while I was, while we were living in Hartford. And then, uh, after Graham died, uh, her name was Susan Lovell. We uh, came back up, or I came back up here and brought my family with me, and uh, settled in Cornish, a couple of years in Meriden, and then. Uh, finally finding pro property here in Cornish, where I'm still living. That's where we are now, right here today. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned um, Ida Williams, now that was your... Ida, Ida Fitch. Ida Williams Fitch. Fitch. Yes, married Alfred Fitch. Married yes. Alfred, so she would have been your grandmother. Yeah, Ida was my grandmother. She's the she, one that went to Claremont after your mother died and stayed. She, she was there the day her daughter died. Oh, she was? Yes. She was uh. She was my grandmother, too. Yeah. Yes, yes. My father's mother. Yes. So yeah. so you, you guys are first cousins. Yes. yes, yes. Because her father and my mother were brother and sister. Bernice Amy was the only sister in the family. Hmm. Yes. The other four boys. Yes. Now, how old was she? What was her age? She was 33 when she died. 33. Huh. Yes. Hmm. So young. So awfully young. Yep. Do you remember all that very clearly? Or? No. I wasn't born. You she weren't? Until two months after she died. Uh -huh. and that's she died why, in February? Yes, she died February. She was born in May. Oh, okay. And uh, huh. she was named Bernice at the request of Maddie Quimby. All right, who lived down the road. Who from lived down, yes. Farm. Because they were very good friends. Ah. Oh, they practically had grown up together because Maddie yeah. had grown up in that house. Huh. She was a Westgate. And Aunt Maddie, and I ca always called her Aunt Maddie. She and Grandma Fitch were buddies, very yeah. close. Yes. By they, Grandma Fitch, you mean Ida? Ida. Yes. Okay. Huh. Yeah. They, they set up a telephone with two tin cans and a string between the two houses. Oh, yeah? That was before telephones came in. Huh. Before the, the the telephone that was just between the two houses? Yes. Oh, I didn't know they had a tin can phone. Yeah, huh. they did. And then they had a signal, and you took a white dish towel, and Grandma Fitch would go out on the front of the north porch and wave that dish towel, and if Aunt Maddie saw it, she knew they needed help up there. Oh, yeah? Come up. Uh, but the porch wasn't there at that time. The porch was built uh, Mother and Dad for your him. father and mother's well, wedding. Aunt Mandy was still down there then. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was back That's in 1914. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> the, the signal had, must have been going even before that. Because, I, uh, well, it would have been very shortly after 1914 that they had the, uh, the two telephones. Because you don't remember the two phones on the wall no. at your house. No. Yes, there was one on each side of the window um, over your stove yeah. and, and uh, um, on each side of that window. Oh, yeah. There was a phone. Huh. One of them was New England Telephone and one was the direct line to oh. Quimby's. 
So they had that direct line to Quimby's, and then they put the New England telephone in. And they Later just on, kept the other one there. And huh. it stayed for a while, and then. Yeah. I can remember the lightning coming through that telephone that stood on the shelf, where you had a receiver on the side of it. Yeah. And you had to crank it. Crank it. Oh yes. And give the operator the number you wanted. Yeah. And that was a magnetophone. Huh. And the lightning came right through the speaker, right out into oh, the yeah. kitchen. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that was scary. Yeah, oh, it is. Huh. I mean, lightning is so strange, the yeah. things that, that it does. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, Aunt Maddie Quimby always sort of, she lost a daughter. Yes. She and Uncle Elwin. And uh, so they sort of called me their daughter, in a way. Yeah. She gave me a birthday present every year, and I was quite old before I realized that she didn't give any of the other kids a birthday present. Oh, yeah. Present. Now, who was this? Mrs. Elwin Quimby, Maddie Quimby. Maddie Quimby, okay. And then when I got up in grade school, I worked for her every summer and every summer through high school because she took boarders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. But I was born in Claremont Hospital back May 9, 1920, because Mother had had wartime flu, the same as Aunt Burness. You mean your mother had? My mother had yeah. the flu. Great. And the doctor didn't think that she would live, oh, yeah. and didn't give a hoop whether I lived or not. Huh. But my mother did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was a little gutsy lady. <laughs> well, huh. the doctor uh, didn't think that you had a chance. Right, I know. That, uh, or either you or your mother had a chance with the uh, flu, because it was deadly. Yeah, and she was working on a little dress one day when the doctor came to the house. They always made house calls. There. Yeah. And he took the dress away from her and told her she wasn't going to be using that. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. She made up her mind she wasn't. <laughs> so there were enough children dying from that, they just assumed that. Well, yeah. it, it wasn't only children, it was any age. Yeah. Because huh. uh, Fred Scruton's wife died from that. You remember Fred? I remember Fred. All right, well, his, his first wife died from that flu. Huh. I didn't realize I that. I didn't know that and, either. And it, he helped everybody in the neighborhood, and he knew where to get his whiskey. And he figured it was his whiskey that saved his life. Oh. Could have. Huh. Who knows? Yeah. But I mean, because uh, when we lived up here, particularly up uh, on, uh, on Mike's father's house, way up the top of nowhere, um, he used to come up and visit with us because Rod was, would pick him up and take him to the flat. Uh, when he was working on the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Fred uh, was to finish out a week. The week turned into 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, huh. but as I say, and he, he told about his wife dying. And then he had a boy, I think it was, that was killed on a bicycle on Ding Dingleton Hill. Oh, Fred did? Yeah. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Car hit him. There was a scrutin that was killed down on Center Road, too, just past the church by a drunken driver. Uh, well, it, it could have been. Was it a boy? Mm -hmm. well, probably it was Fred's boy then, rather huh. than on Dingleton. Right. But I knew that yeah. Fred huh. had said that. Hmm. Now, when, when you two were growing up, were you close? Did, Not really, did you see you each did. other much? Uh, well, I would spend a week every summer up at their house. Yeah. Until, I don't know just when I stopped. You remember Doing when she that. came up for a week? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Ida was there. Ida would come for Irvin, a different week. Irvin would come. Ah. Yeah. Did a different week for each one? Yes. The three yes. Times. And then so Buddy, Buddy Fitch, the whole Frank Fitch family came from Athens, Georgia. Yeah. They would drive up, and Aunt Beulah and Uncle Frank and Betty would go back home and leave Buddy there. Yeah. And Buddy would spend the rest of the summer until school time. Ah. And Aunt Beulah, that broad shelf in Mother's cupboard, would be covered with medicines for Buddy to take in case he needed it. Oh, yeah. And all the time he was there, he never took a pill or anything. <laughs> <laughs> she never would let him have more than one donut of Mother's Donuts. Oh, yeah. After she left, why, well, he had all he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> never heard of any. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's very strange. A mother's idea some of the time that a child has got to have all this medicine and oh, yeah. so many uh, different things like that. I feel that the less medicine you take, the healthier you are. <laughs> Sometimes it seems that way. Well, with my granddaughter, the cystic fibrosis, they put her on a very strict diet after they had diagnosed her because she was about two years old at the time. 
and the poor kid was starving to death. Mm. And her mother got disgusted and she said, never mind the diet, let her eat what she wants. Well, she lived to grow up and is a very happy young lady working in a dentist's office oh, yeah. huh. in Florida. She mm. likes the Florida because she says it's too cold up here. And, she, and another thing, she's afraid of catching cold, mm -hmm. which would, could be oh, yeah. very serious. Yes. Uh -huh. but, uh, she's, she's a fantastic person. And, but as I say, her mother couldn't stand the fact that she wasn't gaining at all. Mm -hmm. Of course, she's petite. I mean, she's tiny. Huh. But uh, she started to gain and, and played soccer in school. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of energy. Oh, sure. Huh. But uh, it was, it was well, interesting. I went to grade school on Diggleton Hill. It was a one-room school. The first two years, it was an old brick one. And Elma Bartlett painted a picture of it, I believe. Oh, yeah. And I have a piece of the brick from that old school. Uh-huh. The uh, wooden, uh. wooden L where the woodshed was. And so this is at the... Um, up above Yasmus. Yeah. Uh, who were the people that lived there? Oh, Monroe. Yeah, Monroe's. Liam Monroe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, once every spring, Mildred Monroe, Mrs. Liam Monroe, would have the whole school come down for a sugar and off party. And she'd give everybody a little dish of syrup and we'd stir it till it turned white, you know. Yeah. And she had donuts, homemade donuts and sour pickles. And every single year I had to have it because everybody else was having it. And the next day I'd be at home so sick. I w I'm allergic to maple syrup. Oh. I'm not allergic to it, but I... It, the sugar. The sugar. I ah. cannot... You cannot tolerate sugar. I have a... Into a t intolerancy to sugar. Right. Yeah. But anyway, I, I learned, and, and one year Aunt Maddie Quimby gave me some stuffed dates for my birthday present. Oh, yeah. They were sweet, too. They were too sweet, but yeah. I ate some of them anyhow. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I went to KUA for two years, and they were changing it to a boys' school, and Bethina wanted to go. She was two years younger than I. I mean, the KUA was boys and girls, and they changed it to just boys for a yes. while? Yeah. Huh. And uh, we could have stayed. The girls that were in there could have stayed and graduated, and I wanted to very badly because I was getting good marks, all A's, you know. But Bethina really wanted to be with me, so I quit KUA and went to Windsor High School. And we lived with Carrie and Nettie Williams, who were Grandma Ida Fitch's two maiden sisters oh, yeah. on Jacob Street. Huh. And they were afraid of men, so we couldn't let them know we were dating any boys. My grandmother was so strict with us, and yet for that reason she told us if we had a date with a fellow, we were to be picked up somewhere besides their house. Oh. So huh. Bethina always was picked up in front of the library over on State Street. And I was usually picked up at Henry and Elizabeth Hall's because that's where I babysat and yeah. worked after school. Huh. Yes, I remember the halls. Yeah. And uh, I spent a number of nights with Carrie and Nettie yeah. in Windsor there. And yep. Carrie always said every single night, she'd holler up the stairwell, Nettie, did you take your Senna? <laughs> and Bethina and I had that as a joke the rest of our life. Yeah. The Senna is a leaf that you, like tea, oh. you simmer it, and then you drink a little of that, and it's supposed to keep you regular. Ah, oh, I see. But every single night, Aunt Carrie would come to the stairs after Aunt Nettie went up to bed. Ah. And Bethina and I had to go through Aunt Nettie's bed to get to our bedroom. So we used to have to be mighty quiet and go in our sock feet. <laughs> try to sneak by her without her knowing what time it was. Mm -hmm. The bathroom was beside Aunt Carrie's bedroom downstairs. Oh, yes. And quite often she knew what time we came. <laughs> you had to babysit that late? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, yes. Interesting. It was fun. Huh. Yes. And then I went to New Jersey and worked for the Darnells, who were, uh, Paul and Ruth Darnell were boarders of Mrs. Quimby. Oh. Summers, they'd come up for a whole month. Huh. And they had two girls, Marjorie and Jean, and she was going to have another little baby. 
And so after they went back to New South Orange, New Jersey, they called up and asked me if I could please come down and help her out because she was quite elderly to be having a new baby and she didn't feel she could handle all three. Hmm. So I was down there until I went down in November before Thanksgiving and I was down there until the next, when was the New York World's Fair, July or August? I don't know. It was in 1939, Yeah. and Arthur Quimby was going to take his mother to the World's Fair. Oh, yeah. It must be Uncle Elwin had passed away then, huh. because I quit the Donnells then and came home and took care of her boarders while she was gone for a whole week. Oh, yeah. Huh. And uh, is that where you were working when you came over to New York when I graduated from the New York Training School? Yeah, in South Orange, New Jersey. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that must have been 1940 then. Yeah, I went down in 1939. Oh yes, yes, yeah. Because 38. No, it had to be. Uh, if you came to my graduation, that was uh, 40. I think. Hmm. I graduated in 38 from high school. Well, it was no, that was before I went to Concord Business College. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go find my diploma right <laughs> yeah, you could prove it. it. Well, not, why don't you sit here for a while, Bernard, so we'll switch places. Oh. I wonder if we're seeing your face very good. Oh, I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could, we could pull the curtain. No, I think it's fine. No. Okay. Okay. Well, Jimmy, you want to say a little bit so, about your life? Well, I was going to ask you how long you, you were in New Jersey. I was in there from before Thanksgiving one fall until the next summer when she wanted to go to the World's Fair, and that was in 39. 39. And I didn't mm. go back to New Jersey after that. Huh. So All right. You must have graduated in 39. Was uh, no, I would have fin uh, I'm sorry there. I would have finished in 39, but then I've gone to uh, Virginia, and to get your diploma, you had to be a year working. Oh. It's a three-year course, two years in school and one year work, working. Huh. So, so then you, you worked in Washington for a while. Well, that was after I went to business college. Oh, yeah. I graduated from business college in 1940, hmm. I think, or 41. And I worked for Tenney Coal Company while I was still going to school there in Concord. And I... Worked. I lived with the Hammond, David Hammond and his wife on Warren Street, took care of their little girl to pay for my board in Rome. Oh, yeah. And sometimes over the weekend I'd go visit Uncle Pete and Aunt Helen. They lived on Lake Avenue then in West Concord. And uh, then I got a job working for the employment, the United States Employment Service in Laconia. So I moved out to Chichester and rented a room from Aunt Mary who ran a the old homestead, a boarding tourist place, and she let me rent a little room up in the back part, in the L. And uh, Emily Fleming lived in Chichester, and she was one of the registrars in the Laconia office, so I rode back and forth to Laconia every day with her. And uh, Jackie Oba was one of the uh, registrars, and a good friend of mine in the office, and so her husband was in the service, so we decided we wanted to room together, so we got an apartment. And her father-in-law took us ice fishing, and we both bought a bicycle and rode all around Laconia on a bicycle when we weren't in the office. And I'm having a lot of fun, but then Grandma Fitch got sick, Ida Fitch got yeah. sick. And Mother needed me at home, so I got a transfer to the Claremont Employment Service office where David Fessenden was the manager then, and that was on Tremont Street up downstairs, and Carol Fitch worked for the welfare department upstairs. Oh. And I didn't know it, and she didn't know I was downstairs. We didn't know each other. But we used to get lunch in the restaurants on Pleasant Street or somewhere there, and we were sitting on a stool eating our lunch one day, and, well, she was there, and I came in, and the only empty stool was beside this red-headed girl. So I sat down and I ordered my lunch, and uh, one of the county commissioners, uh, Keeley. I've heard it. Is Henry it Keeley. Yeah, I've heard that name. He was way down the further end, and he got through his lunch, and he comes over and he claps us both on the back, 
and says, I didn't know you two girls knew each other. <laughs> we looked at each other, we don't. <laughs> so then we got acquainted. Huh. Uh, was it Henry Keeley or was it uh, the doctor Charles Keeley? Henry Keeley. I didn't know Charles Keeley. Well, Charles Keeley was a doctor there from 1923 in Clamont. So, so that's that's how my mom met my dad was through you. Yeah, she didn't get to Pittsfield very often to see her folks, so I would take her home with me for the weekend. Oh yeah. And then Orville would bring us back. Oh yeah. yeah. So they got acquainted that way. Yeah. Huh. So do you did did you keep track of things that were going on with Bernice and more or less through her mother? Through yeah, write letters back and forth. Yes, mother was a good. Writer. Yes. Letter writer. Yes. Right. But uh, things that happened in my life that I just didn't want to write a letter. Yeah. I, I still have a very difficult time writing a letter. Mm. You do? Yes. Yes. Mm. Because of, of what happened then. Oh, yeah. A number of times on, on letters. Huh. And if I didn't say something just right, it was held against me. And oh, yeah. Oh, dear. And if it wasn't spelled just right or the comma in the right place, I was told to do it over again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. I just rattle off a letter so easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you get your letters back and told to correct them. Yeah. You wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't write where after, would you? No. No, it's... I don't blame <laughs> <laughs> How many years have you been living in this house? It's more than 40 years. More than 40 years. Uh, in fact, it'll be 42 years come September. Uh -huh. Because we moved here in 56. Oh, yeah. We came up from uh, Connecticut in 53. Yeah. Uh. And Rod's mother had died in 52. Because at one time, Rod and his mother came up to some place. Well, 93 has gone through the property that we wanted, that I would like to have bought. It was a chicken farm up there with another, with an extra apartment and everything. But uh, with a tiny baby and another child, I just could not make the trip to come up. And Rod and his mother came up and looked at it and she wouldn't come up here. No, no way would she come up here. And yet she'd come off of farms, uh, you know, in western Connecticut. Down there, yeah. And, uh, so we didn't we didn't buy the property and and we uh, were told one of the businessmen in, uh, on uh, Main Street in Hartford would have financed it for us, hmm. but uh, we didn't get up here yeah. at that time. But after she died, we did. How about Rodney's father? I, mean, I never knew Rodney's father. He had died when Rod was only about 14 years old. Oh yeah. And he was very deeply in debt, so there was nothing left for Rodney. His mother had to get off the farm because it had to be sold for I see. to pay his debts, and uh, huh. she uh, did housework in Sharon in the village for oh. a while, and then uh, her oldest son talked her into moving into uh, Hartford, yeah. and she ran a rooming house in Hartford, hmm. and uh, well, uh, Rod used to sell papers on the corner. He delivered papers to the apartments uh, because that was a, a big area of apartment houses. And he washed dishes in a restaurant for his meals. He uh, set up pins in the bowling alley. He racked up the pool tables. And so he did any number of things. And then finally he went into uh, uh, Royal Typewriter, oh. which is where I met him. Yeah. And, of course, that was at the time of Pearl Harbor. And I was the only girl that didn't cry when we were laid off. I had taken a day and gone and got a job in a bank because I could not do the work and mm. do the production at Royal Typewriter because that was hurry, 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 hurry. Now, how come they get laid off because of the war? Uh, because all these uh, plants had to tool up for oh, production oh, I see. to make guns and so forth. So they didn't need people to do that? Well, they did, but uh, while they were tooling up, what were they going to do oh, with I these see. people? I see. And Rod didn't have a, a job at the time we were married. I was working in the bank. Uh-huh. 
but he had finally been laid off because they had gotten all of the uh, typewriters out that they could, in that length of time, finish yeah. out. And uh, when we got back from a two-day honeymoon in New York City, he went down to call Patent Firearms and they said, where you been? We've been looking for you. <laughs> because he had applied down there previously. Oh, but yeah. They, but they hadn't done anything about it and <coughs> until just he come back. Wait after. for him to show up. <laughs> <laughs> huh. hmm. No, it was, it was interesting. And, yeah. Well, I went from working on Tremont Street, we moved the office up to Pleasant Street, and I worked for A.J. Severns because David Fesman had gone to Washington, D.C. to work. And A.J. Severns was the manager of the office, and I was his private secretary, plus I was a receptionist and did all the records, red tape forms. Oh, I hated those. <laughs> And one Saturday morning, Severance comes along and says, Miss Fitch, come with me. We're going for a walk. And I said, we can't. I've got all these reports that have to get out. Come on, we're going for a walk. And I said, what about the work? It was at desk. One of the girls can tend to it. And it seems that Abby Wilder, the state director, had called him and said there was a girl in his office that she wanted to work for Congressman Foster Stearns no. in Washington. He needed a new secretary. And uh, A.J. Well, you went. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Washington, <laughs> walked up into the house office building and didn't know where my office was or anything. And Margaret Marquis from Colorado, she worked for the Colorado congressman. She comes down the corridor, they were marble corridors, you know. You must be Ferny Bitch. <laughs> I'll show you where your room is. <laughs> so I was Ferny Bitch all the time. I oh, my soul. <laughs> Just to her. The other girls didn't call me that, but I should hope not. Michael did. She was quite a bit older than I. But she was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh -huh. So she showed me where my office was, and both Congressman Stearns and the campaign manager, A.C. Cartledge, were up in New Hampshire. So I had to get the mail every day, open it, check the files to see how he answered other letters. Oh, yeah. And I'd answer the letters in his name. Huh. Oh. And he'd sign them or he wouldn't even look at them? He wasn't there. Oh, yeah. Huh. I would sign them as secretary. Yeah, know? yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an experience. The first week in Washington, they said it was the hottest week it had been in 71 years. Oh. And I no air conditioning. No air conditioning. Yes, in the office building it was, but oh. outside it wasn't. Uh -huh. And you'd come out of there and get on a streetcar with a lot of blacks and whites and everything, Spanish and so forth, and, and boy, it was hot, mm. smelly. And I rode all the way out to Glen Echo, Maryland, where I had, I had called or written to the Fessendens to tell them I was coming to Washington to work. And Mr. Stearns's, Congressman Stearns's other secretary was pregnant, and that's why she was getting through. And she was a Catholic, and he, he was Catholic also, Mr. Stearns. And uh, she was supposed to find me an apartment, and she hadn't done anything about it. So I called David and Thelma Fesnan when I landed there from the Union Station, and I asked them what was the best hotel to stop in until I found out. Yeah. where my apartment was, and they said, well, don't do that. Get on a certain streetcar and come on out to our house. So I did. So I roomed with them, and finally the Saunders, who lived across the street diagonally, they wanted me to uh, room there. So I roomed at Saunders, and then I ate at Pheasanton's. Mm. Did dinner at night and breakfast in the morning. Huh. And then, of course, I ate lunch out downtown. How long were you in Washington? until uh, 1945 in the fall. I worked for a corporation lawyer after Mr. Stearns failed to win the Senate seat. Oh, I see. Huh. He ran against Charles Toby, and Toby won by a few votes. Yeah. Mr. Stearns was a statesman. He wasn't a politician, and he wouldn't use any of the dirt we wrote in his speeches. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Toby didn't know me, so I'd attend some of his speeches, and I'd take shorthand notes. And then I'd go back and I'd tell the campaign manager what Mr. Toby said and how he acted and this and that. And we would put some of those things in the 
speeches. We'd sit up till two or three o'clock in the morning writing speeches for Congressman Stern. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, we lived good. in a hotel carpenter in Manchester there for a while, and then up in Concord. We had an office and huh. lived in a hotel there till he was out, and then I went back to Washington, of course, so we had to close the office up and so forth. And I had packed my trunk, and Mr. Cartledge called me one day and said, Bernie, I'm going to take you out to lunch. And I said, you are. What's the catch? No catch, no catch. I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> but anyway, I went out to lunch with him in a nice hotel. It was very pleasant. We got through and got out in the car. And he says, I'm going to take you for a little ride. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> where to? And he took me out to Arlington, Virginia, where Norman Littell lived. And Norman Littell had been kicked out of the Department of Justice by President Roosevelt because of insubordination with Francis Biddle, head of the War, de no, war Department, <laughs> whatever. And uh, he was in bed with a bad back, but he needed to open a private law office, and he needed a secretary. And I hate to see a man sick in bed. <laughs> How can you say no to a guy yeah. like that? <laughs> And so I said, well, I would try it until he could find someone else, because I did want to come back to New Hampshire. So without a pencil or a pen or a typewriter or an office, I started out. Ah. And when I got through, what was it, seven months later, I quit. We had three offices, all decorated the same, two tones of green with gold draperies. He had an office. I had an office with an assistant. I had a telephone switchboard, everything, and then we had an office down the hall for an associate lawyer that worked under Mr. Littell. Huh. Is that the Littell from Cornish? No. Oh, no. Um, it was, that was, I almost had two nervous breakdowns working for him. It was a tough assignment. Mm. He was very particular. And everything that didn't go right, he blamed his secretary on, even though it wasn't my fault at all. If he was late to an appointment, it was his secretary's fault. She didn't get the brief typed when I had it typed hours before he left, oh, yeah. you know, but oh, yeah? that's all right. Huh. Anyway, I came home and I was going to work for Henry Hall and his brother Dick, who ran the grain store in Windsor. And that was then Pack and Pollard? Pack and Pollard. Yeah. I got a job there, but I never started because Mom had to go to bed with the change of life business and she was sick. Mm. Oh. She was so sick with that. I, we thought we were going to lose her. And Grandma Fitch was sick at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you remember all that happening? Well, I wasn't up here. I was in Connecticut oh, yeah. at the time. So it would have been letters written back and forth. Mm -hmm. but. Yes. Mother would tell me to give Grandma Fitch a bath. And she wasn't about to take a bath. No, oh, yeah. No, sir. I said, well, let me take your sweater off, Grandma. No, I'll call James. I said, well, if you don't call James, I'm going to get James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was tough taking care of her. She was so independent, oh, yeah. and her mind was going then. Hmm. Well, your mother really put in a tough time with her. She did, because she was only 20 when she married Dad at 30, and Uncle Louis was still living there, going to college and coming back home. Yeah. Frank and Harold had been in the First World War, but Lewis was too young. And Dad had to run the farm and put everybody through college. Yep, yep. And when Harold came back, he stopped at our house before he came home up here mm -hmm. in Cornish. Yes. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I've still got the pictures or not, or whether it's something that went by the board of uh, Uncle Harold in all his uniform and so forth outside the uh, dining room oh, yeah. windows. We've got, we've got a pictures. picture of all four boys. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen that picture. Dad and Harold yeah. and Frank and Lewis. They all look like hoodlums. Yeah, boys. they do. Yeah. They look that like was at Grandma's funeral. Oh, was that when? Yes. Oh. Grandma Fitch's? Grandma Fitch's funeral. I was pregnant expecting Beth that day of the funeral. Huh. As big as a horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at the time of her funeral, well, I hadn't figured that I could come anyway, but then we were all sick. 
Be at the time of the funeral? Uh, yes. This would have been in 50, in 49? 49. Yeah. Yes, because January 49, because Frank was going to be a year old. Hmm. And in the first place, Rodney, my oldest son, had had pneumonia uh, over Veterans Day in November. And Graham was living with us, that's my husband's mother, and she had virus pneumonia in December. The first week of January, when Grandma Fitch died, I had something or other and spent one day in bed. My husband worked that day and he came home and spent the next four days in bed. Rodney, my son, had pneumonia again that week. And two weeks later, Rodney and Byron both had the mumps. Oh my goodness. Oh my word. And then, while they were getting over the mumps, Graham was having virus pneumonia again. And Frank, the uh, baby of a year, had bad diarrhea. And I had a roaring sore throat. I called. And it was a Wednesday, and there were always two doctors on call on Wednesday in that town. All the others were gone, period. And a, a lovely German woman doctor came to the house. She treated both Frank and I, saw Graham walking around with her long chenille bathrobe on and a blanket wrapped around her, and two boys still with mumps. She never told me to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> she knew better. She knew it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Good huh. sakes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, right after that, my husband was home sick for a month. Hmm. I don't know what it was, but he, he was out. He Got was, a hard year. Oh, it was. And then, Frank had come down with mumps. And in May, Graham went to see uh, one of her other boys by her first marriage, and Rodney came down with measles, but it took him a week plus a couple of days to break out, and the doctor said, it looks like measles, but he couldn't be sure until he broke out. Huh. And then the other two boys, he wanted to give the gamma globulin so they wouldn't get as severe a case of it, but that was something else, and I had to take the other two boys up to the doctor's office. And what was I going to do without Graham no, <laughs> taking yeah. Rodney? I couldn't take him out of bed to go up there. But I had a lovely neighbor across the road who'd been a school teacher for years and years and years. And she adored that boy, of, oldest boy of mine. Because he would sit across, uh, on his, well, he had a, a little, uh, well, three wheel vehicle. It wasn't a, uh, a tricycle, but it was a handmade one. And he'd sit there on the sidewalk, hi, Reedman, hi, Reedman, every time she was outdoors. And she loved it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, if you'd only, you could only, you don't have to go up and see him so that, you know, you won't be exposed to the measles. By golly, she came over and she sat right up there beside him all the time. When he was gone. <laughs> 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 mm. but it was Where were you living then? On uh, Stone Street in uh, Manchester. Oh, in Manchester. Yes. Hmm. Manchester, Connecticut. Yeah. Well, Grandma Fitch died on the 7th, I think, and she was buried on her birthday, which was the 11th of January. January. And Beth, the was, and Beth was born the 15th. <coughs> huh. So I was pretty close to having her, you see, when the funeral. Mm. So you were born about a month after um, Helen's mother died, mm -hmm. and Beth was born about a month after... Well, three years. Be four days after Grandma was buried. Oh. After she was buried. After she was buried. Oh, a week, a week after yeah. she died. Huh. Mm -hmm. And I was born two months after Aunt Bernice died. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. Well, it's, it's quite interesting the the way things interact with yeah. families. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one time uh, when. Uh, I was up to your house on a sing. We didn't sing. We went up to uh, uh, Arthur's granddaughter's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, up to the Heath cabin. The, yes, the Heath yeah. cabin. And 
uh, we got to talking and the girls were so fascinated because I was visiting uh, Grandma and uh, Bernice's folks at the time the Quimby's Westgate put in the electricity. Oh yeah. And we had a big do down there that night and old man Westgate was still alive at the time and he flipped the switch to turn on the first light. <laughs> oh, that was nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, Arthur was so uh, uh, <coughs> excited when he found out that I had been there that night. Oh, yeah. Because in, I don't know how it came up, but... So that was in the 40s? No, no, oh. it was before that. Way before that. Because mm. oh, Mr. Westgate died when... I can just barely remember him, and I was born in the 20s, see? Yeah. Well, I, w I would say before, or around 1928, or maybe before. I remember seeing him mm -hmm. when I was young, but that's all. Yeah. So, so they must have got electricity a while before it came up. Yeah. Yeah. The other house. Yes, this was a cola system that they put in. Yeah. Well, Dad wanted to get electricity because Grandma Fitch was getting the shakes. Oh. Um, and she would carry a lamp. Oh, I see. A lit lamp right up against her chest and hold on to it and go into the bedroom and we were so afraid she'd catch on fire. Yeah. And he couldn't afford to put in the number of poles. You had to pay for the number of poles from where the last wire was. Oh yeah. And he didn't have enough money to do that so he had gas lights put in. Yeah. So in the 1938 hurricane we had gas lights. Oh uh, yeah. But then we got electricity soon after that. Yeah. I remember looking in the black book and I think they had the gas lights for seven years. Uh huh. Because um, I remember visiting up there with the gas lights because yeah. you, you turned and you had a flint. Yeah, yeah, we've got one set upstairs that the flint still works. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's screwed into the wall like the it's pipe a, is still it, there. We wanted to leave them in there. Yeah, just for yeah we put one, one room had just, the just set in there. It's not hooked to the gas at all. Well, there's no gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one down at St. Gardens in his, the little studio where the, right beside his desk that he used to use to jot oh. out ideas. Oh, there's yeah. A gas light on the wall. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, during the hurricane, that chandelier in the kitchen over the dining room table just swung back and oh, forth. Yeah. Yeah. We all stood there and watched a huge basswood tree go slowly down to the ground. Huh. Well, I stood in the dining room at home, and the tree that had been planted at my birth came over toward the house, but there was about six. It, ended up about six feet away. This is down at Claremont. At Claremont, oh, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And I also stood uh, there and watched the old wagon shed roof come up, turn over twice, and land in the old pig pen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, there were no pigs in it. <laughs> well, Dad lost just about all the east woods, the pines, you know, down yeah. there, and the maple orchard. Yeah, I've seen pictures there. Southwest of the house. Yeah. That was just a mess. Yeah. yeah. I tried to go up. Barrett's Hill to show a friend of mine from New Jersey the glass house and she couldn't walk on the the logs. The logs of the trees were all down. Oh yeah. And we'd have to walk along the trunk of one tree and then jump to another tree and so forth and she almost fainted. So we wow. turned around and went back home. Did not do that. <laughs> huh. That's scary. Yeah. You know, and but that time. that to hurricane was so interesting because it it jumped from spot to spot because uh, before they'd had time to clean it up. Well, and as a matter of fact, my father had an uh, electric milking machine at the time, and he had a contract with the power company that he would have electricity. Mm. And they strung the wire from the power company in Claremont right out to him. Oh, yeah? And didn't stop to hook up anybody else along the way. Huh. Ooh. Yes. But yes. that didn't go real big. I bet it did. <laughs> well, I mean, they had the contract. Yeah. They, they had signed it. the contract. Yeah. Huh. But there again, uh, by bringing it right straight out through, then it was available to, to hook everybody else yeah. in this time went on. Yeah. Huh. And uh, it was interesting because right after that, I had to get back to New York for my second year of school. And the trains weren't running because the tracks were damaged. Yeah. And I don't know why the bus would go down the river road instead of Charlestown Road. But however, it was so fascinating because we went uh, by uh, Lockwood's farm 
and he had turned his big barn into a chicken house. And so that the front of it was all open. You'd have thought the hurricane would have taken that. Yeah. But it didn't. Huh. There were little rain shelters out back of the big barn. They were topsy-turvy and all over the place. But the barn was spared. Huh. And you, then you'd go along and everything would be fine. And then there'd be a, a whole stretch where everything was flat. So they touched down different places, some of the Yeah, times. I think we had a hurricane in Cornish Flat that was like that. Yeah. It would take lawn chairs from your dooryard and put it way over across the street, across the next person's property, and throw it in the brook. Yeah. And yet I had a pair of little red shoes that I was married in that the kids had been playing with, and they had left them up on top of the hen house roof. And I thought we went out looking around to see the damage the next day because a lot of our roofing shingles were off and so forth, and our lawn furniture was all gone, so forth. And here were those shoes sitting there. Sitting right there. And we thought they had nailed them down to the roof. Huh. <laughs> Conan got a little ladder and climbed up there, and they were just sitting there. Huh. But the hurricane had gone the other side and didn't blow them off. Both so sides and didn't touch that building. Hmm. Uh, it, it was very interesting. Yeah. Very hmm. interesting. And Dad was milking, and he put a, a prop on the big barn doors. And by the time he could get around inside to put a prop on the inside, <laughs> the, uh, the doors were bulging in about four feet. Oh yeah. Because the, the vibration. Yeah. Dad, I was had a cold that day. I was supposed to have been working for Mrs. Quimby, and I had gone home because I had this bad head cold, and I was walking around barefoot down back of, north of the house under the Macintosh red tree, mm -hmm. and an apple tree has a main root that goes straight down, and I knew that, and I was standing there barefooted, and the ground was heaving. Oh, yeah. And that scared me to dickens. I ran up to the house and told Dad, and he said, well, run up to the pasture and get the cows down, and I'll open the front door. He says, I don't dare open the big roll door. And so I went up and got the cows, and they came up around by the garden. Mom came out to keep them yeah. out of the garden. Yeah. <laughs> and we took them right in the little door. Up front. So you got them inside? Mm -hmm. yeah. huh. Well, that afternoon, I took the first driving license test in Claremont. Before the hurricane? Before the hurricane. Ah. <laughs> and the uh, tester wanted to find out how high the water was at Lower Village, at Beauregard Village. Yeah. And so my test was to drive down there. <laughs> <laughs> and the water was up over the road. Yeah. But there's a house right there where you come down North Street. And I turned around in that driveway. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you can remember the year you took it. <laughs> <laughs> Good way good. to remember. Yeah. Yeah. But huh. pe people laugh about it too. I mean, it's it's a comical time. Yeah. I think that I caused the, that caused the hurricane. <laughs> yeah. I was That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, I think you should tell a little about your life. Um. You're one of the Diggleton Hill Fitches. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to. Think of my connection with you two, and how I remember visiting you, your family when I was younger. I used to come out there for a few days at a time. I, I did spend the night with Bruce. Mm -hmm. um, I remember getting in trouble because one time when my mom came to get me, I wasn't. We weren't around. We were up in the woods somewhere. And oh, up in back. Yeah, she got pretty angry because I wasn't there to go home when I was supposed to be. <laughs> they had a playhouse up in the woods and back, a treehouse. Yeah. Mm. I don't remember where we were, but uh -huh. I got in trouble for that. <laughs> you wouldn't have been a boy if you didn't. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we had a great time when you lived in the apartment after your fire. There. How long did you live there? Two months. Two months, huh? Yeah. Well, no, it must have been closer to three, because we burned in April. Yeah. And we stayed up on the hill with Grace and James. Yeah. Uh, for two weeks. Uh huh. And then we got enough furniture together to go down to the apartment there. And uh, well, that's where Aunt Maddie lived. That, yeah. The, the old part. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, where my dad is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we moved back down here in August because... Well, that was pretty quick. 
Well, we mo we mo actually moved into a kitchen, living room, and bathroom. Yeah, that's all you needed. Be be well, because I didn't want to stay there any longer. Your folks would not accept any rent. Oh yeah, huh? Because they had told me originally a month rent free. Well, fine. The beginning of the next month, I wrote out a check, and uh, my husband Rod took it down to the barn and gave it to your father Orville. Before he got back from the barn, your mother Carol had brought it back to me and said, <laughs> we will not accept it. <laughs> I just couldn't see, you know, staying any longer than we absolutely had to huh. if, they, if they would not accept any rent. Mm. It would have made it easier in a way if they had. Yeah. Where did you go huh. to grade school? Cornish, right at the Cornish school. The elementary school? Yeah. The new school? Yeah, the new school. I think that opened in um, probably in the early 50s, 52 maybe? 52, uh, was it? No, no, 50? no. Because, 53. Uh, the boys, we, we came up in 53 and the boys went to the center school. Oh, they did? Oh. Uh, that's Rodney and uh, Byron that year. And then when we came back here in 56, the school had been used for a couple of years. Uh -huh. So 54, 54 maybe, 34 54, somewhere in there. Huh. They hadn't started it when yeah. we were living here in 53. Hmm. Well, 54 was when we went to Meriden. So it was probably... So it was probably 55, I would think, oh, that yeah. it would have opened. Burnham Carter lived in the Crowley place where... Newbolt's lived there. Yeah. yeah. Michael Newbolt lived yeah. there. And he had a lot to do with getting the school put through hmm. the town. Now, wasn't there something with Barrett too? Didn't he? Wasn't he involved in that and got angry? Or seems like there's been a story with him in that school. Maybe not. I think they were in California then. Oh, they were. Huh. Maybe I I just something rang a bell there, but I'm not sure. How it went. Because they were in California when I was first married in 1946. And I became town clerk in 1947. Mm. And uh, no, you were town clerk in 47. Well, oh, you were town clerk for a while before Avis McMillan. Two years. Oh. I had Steve. Yeah. And then I got pregnant with Beth, and I wouldn't sign up again. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. I said I could quit being yeah. town clerk if I couldn't quit getting pregnant. <laughs> But anyway, that's when I was first town clerk that I wrote to the Barretts and told them that the hedgehogs were chewing the glass house up there, oh, the yeah, foundation, yeah, yeah. and people had broken in and torn the telephone off the wall and done other damage. And I said there were two file, metal file cabinets up there, and if the Barretts were not going to use them anymore, could I buy them for the town clerk office because I didn't have any file cases oh, there. Yeah. And they wrote back and said that if my husband and I could get them down off the hill without hurting them, we could have them for the town office. Oh, isn't that nice? Huh. So we took a big sled and climbed up there and put the two <laughs> with a blanket between them, you know. Yeah. Are they, are they you still using them? Yes. Yeah. I left them to the huh. town. Huh? Yeah. So that was in 47 or? Yeah. Huh. Well, she was young and agile then. Yeah. 47 or 48 when we got them, probably. Well, somebody must have tore that glass house down because there's no glass or Somebody anything. from Plainfield, hmm. after Mr. Barrett got my letter, he wrote to this friend in Plainfield and asked him to please. He didn't want his home desecrated. Yeah. And yeah. so he asked him to take it down. Uh -huh. huh. So that was probably in 48, yeah. 49 that they took it down. Hmm. I always felt bad that I never got up to see it. Yeah. Well, you didn't. No, hmm. no. I've, well, got, I've got some snapshots of Conan up there standing in front of the glass house with one of the school teachers that taught at Cornish Center. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know which teacher it was. Hmm. What, uh, what schoolhouse did Sigrid Christensen teach in? Was that the center? Mm-hmm. I bet it was her then, because she, no. lived, uh, cause she lived with the uh, Johnsons. It wasn't her, because uh -huh. I knew her. Oh, yes. And I don't know who this lady was, but... Conan hmm. said it was one of his school teachers. Yeah. So she's standing in front of the glass house? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Huh. 
Do you think I should put some lights on? No. This will be fine. Oh, well, probably. What time? It's getting time to get... Yeah, time to close it off. Close it off. It's been yeah, nice. Been... This has been fun for me to talk to you, Till. Oh, well, <laughs> we've only begun. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can, we can keep going another evening. Yes. I'd be glad to come back and get this going again. Because, I mean, to, uh, the, the things that I've done since I've been here. Yeah, yeah. It would be interesting because with uh, these things on the wall. Yeah. And then this couple of more over here and this one over there and so forth. <laughs> That'll be great. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll continue this another didn't time. Don't tell anything about my children. Well, or, we no. haven't want to talk about. Okay. No, because okay. I haven't, uh, you know, but yeah. just barely spoken of mine. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. I think I was. No, I was through. I don't know how much of that. I, huh. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it stop either. Oh dear. Let's see. Huh. It's all on one side. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll close for now, and we can think of new things to talk about for another time. Okay. We can listen to this first. Do you want uh -huh. to hear this now? Uh -huh. This is uh, Wednesday, May twenty seventh, and we're adding on to the tape that we started. What was it, last Tuesday? A week ago? A week ago. Anyway. A week ago. Um, and Helen had, and Bernice both had more things they wanted to add to the tape, and so we're going to have another session here. And Helen's going to start, and Bernice will be along in a little while. What I wanted to speak about was the uh, Civil Air Patrol that I joined in 1980. My husband had been a member since, I believe, 73 and had been very active in it. In uh, 81, he became commander of the Cobra Cadet Squadron, and we worked together on it until he was no longer able to uh, do it in uh, about 1986. But when he gave up, they gave, or just before he gave up the commandership, they uh, honored him as uh, commander of the squadron uh, for the year and gave him a uh, certificate of commander's commendation and because I had worked so closely with him they also gave me one but he had the the honor of being uh, commander of the year time went on uh, I stayed with the uh, squadron after he his death he never uh, retired from it, but he wasn't able to do anything. But I stayed with him ever since, and now they have made me commander of the Cobra Cadet Squadron. And also, the thing they gave me was a Senior of the Year, which is quite an honor because that ends up going to national and being judged against 49 other people. So mm. that uh, I'm pretty proud of that. So the your accomplishments get judged or what gets judged? Uh, what they write up oh, I on see. it. Uh -huh. And it, it would be the things that I had done uh, in the Civil Air Patrol and the, the leadership or whatever. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I have two commander's commendations. Uh, because I uh, stayed with the radio. Uh, we have net every, mor uh, every morning but Sunday. And for about three years, I was the only one that was calling it. Mm. Uh, of course, a few of the times when I was gone, there wasn't any, but then when I'd come back, we'd pick it up again. For a while, there was only one other person that's answering. And now there's three of us that uh, get on it. And uh, we often answer the main wing net too, oh. or at least I do. And uh, the people from the main wing, wing uh, answer our net. So it, it keeps contact. And the reason for all of this is to know that the radios work in case of emergency. Because when the plane was down uh, a year ago, Christmas time, or the plane disappeared from Lebanon Airport, uh, the Civil Air Patrol spent many, many, many hours hunting, uh, and they do not get paid for doing it. The only thing they get is gas money and oil for the planes. And so that if 
people had had to be paid for that hunt. Nobody could have afforded it. Yeah, it's a lot of man time. A lot of man time. Oh, yeah. A lot of man time. But, uh, you know, just paying the, the gas, we can, we can do it when we don't get paid for our time. Yeah. If it's no out-of-pocket money for you, it makes a big difference. Or not much out-of-pocket money. Well, uh, sometimes people have to take time off from work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so whether they, depending on the company they work for, yeah. what kind of a, an arrangement is made. But in case of emergency, they have to let us go the same as they do the National Guard. Yeah. Huh. Now, the Civil Air Patrol, you um, you look for down planes, lost planes. Lost planes, lost people. Lost people. Yes, if a child wanders away, or if a, uh, an older person that's uh, dementia or Alzheimer's wanders away, we go hunt for them. Now, do you have your own planes? Yes, we have some of our planes are uh, uh, Air Force planes that have been given to us. <clears throat> the you retired uh, Air, Force, Air Force planes? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And once in a great while, this one that's a little newer. Yeah. Uh, but the, the whole fleet has changed considerably since I first was in it. And, but they're the smaller planes. The, they can carry four people, but generally they only put three in them oh, because yeah. of weight considerations. Yeah. And if you've got two observers and a pilot, uh, it does quite well on a hunt. So you have binoculars that you're looking around and... I've never used binoculars. I've done the, the scan of the ground. Uh -huh. there's, there's a way that, you know, you watch and look back and forth. Oh, I yeah. So, they, they so you follow a pattern. I see. And the, our flights are in a pattern. Uh -huh. Sometimes we uh, follow the direction that the plane was supposed to go on either side of that to yeah. see if they've come down. Yeah. But first of all, they look in the at the airports before we start out anywhere to make sure they haven't la landed at, a, at an airport and forgot to call in. Oh, them. yeah, <laughs> yeah. They that's were a there. good point. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, a big point because every yeah. once in a while somebody will. Yeah. And then, hey. Yeah, you just don't know. We don't need to go out huh. covering the, the uh, ground for nothing. Yeah. But then, uh, if that uh, proves fruitless, then we do a pattern search. In a, uh, each plane is assigned to a certain block of, of space, yeah. and you cover that. So you have maps you go over on the ground yes. first to decide what you're doing. Oh, yes. Huh. We have maps at, that are gridded yeah. so that you go this far, yeah. and there's you know, different patterns of search, but I mean, yeah. that's huh. uh, just an interesting item. Yeah. But the... Um, do, you, do, do you use satellite pictures? The uh, satellites many times tell us where there is something down. Yeah. They pick up the ELT, which is Emergency Located Transmitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which goes off when on impact. Yeah. Huh. And that plane, uh, a year ago at Christmas time, had taken its ELT off the plane. Oh. That makes it suspicious, doesn't it? If they... Oh, I yeah. tell you, you, you talk to different people and they all say, hey, they had planned that. Yeah, yeah. Especially when nobody's found it for a year and a half. Yes, but they sometimes do not look in the exact right spot. Oh, yeah. Because uh, my husband was helping on a search in Vermont, and he and another guy wanted to look in a certain spot. And they said, no, the plane can't possibly be there. Yeah. Well, about five years later, a hunter found that plane in that, right there. In that huh. area. Yeah. So you really can't say it isn't here. Oh, yeah. They look everywhere. Because they stray off course. Yeah. Like like anybody hiking. Yeah. When they're lost, it's because they didn't stay on the path. That they planned, yeah. That they planned on. Yeah. Huh. And then hey, well where am I? I can't I can't yeah. find my yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> that spot don't look right. <laughs> I'm not in the right place. And then they don't show up where they're supposed to be and people have to start hunting yeah. for them. How many years has the Civil Air Patrol been going? When did it start? It started just before Pearl Harbor. Oh. Back in 41. Mm -hmm. They were chartered by Congress the 1st of December in 1941. Huh. And they have been 
active ever since. Yeah. But the reason uh, for that, war was going on in Europe, and the small planes in Europe were all grounded. Oh, yeah. And the pilots in this country felt that they could be of help. And they were, because the pilots on the eastern coast where it would be reasonable to get to the ocean, oh, yeah. were spawning submarines. Oh, yeah. And finally, I mean, they would get out there and they would radio back. Well, by the time uh, an, uh, an Air Force plane or an Army plane got out there, the submarine was long gone. Oh, yeah. So finally they started giving them bombs. Huh. And the uh, Civil Air Patrol actually sunk one or two. Oh, they did? Oh, yes. Yeah. Huh. Yes. I'm not sure of the number, but yeah. I know they, it was some of them. And another thing they did was to tow target for target practice oh, yeah. for the gunners oh, on, I see. on the planes. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. So, I mean, they could help. Yeah. And uh, Mayor LaGuardia out of New York City was one of the instigators. Oh, yeah. Along with a number uh -huh. of other people. So, so there's a, it's in the um, federal budget, they have money for the... Uh, very, uh, it goes through the Air Force budget. I see. Oh, okay. Yes. Huh. But the, like everything else, they're trying to cut us down and down and yeah, down and yeah, down. Yeah. But, hey, what can you do? Uh -huh. the, the things that, that the Civil Air Patrol does uh, saves the taxpayers. In the long run, yeah. An awful lot of money. Yeah. An awful All lot of donated money. donated time. Yes. Yeah. Because the time is all donated. Yeah. It's all donated. Uh, even our wing commander donates his time. Huh. He does get some expense money yeah. because he has to go to national meetings hmm. and things of that sort. But, I mean, he really he really doesn't get his time paid. Yeah, yeah. Now how many, are there like chapters around the country or what's the... Uh, there is a wing in each state. I see. Each state has... Each state has a wing. I see. Then, of course, you've got your whole national headquarters oh, yeah. that is down in Montgomery, Alabama, oh, at yeah. Maxwell Air Force Base. But then each each state has a wing. And then in the wing, depending on the size of the state, you may have, um, oh, what is it they call them? Mm. Well, never mind. It's, uh, it's like a county. Because, say in Texas, yeah, you can't meet once a month right. in one in one Too place, yeah. uh, just for a, a two-hour meeting. Yeah, it just is impossible. So if you break it down into um, groups, then you can keep that yeah. group together and know what is going on, right. what help is needed, and that sort of thing. But a, a state the size of New Hampshire, we do not have groups. I see. Because even from Colebrook, you can get to Concord yeah. once a month for a two-hour meeting. How many people in New Hampshire are involved? I mean, I need uh, there's, this roughly. there's a couple of hundred of them. Oh, there are. Oh, yes. Huh. Oh, yes. Now, if somebody wanted to join that, how do you, what's the process of joining them? Find somebody who belongs and they can <laughs> help you there. I see. Yes. Huh. Well, in fact, I have applications for both the seniors and cadets. I see. And uh, huh. I can sign them up, and oh, yeah. then they send their money in, huh. because it's a, it's a come and pay proposition. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You pay to belong. Uh huh. And in fact, I've just gotten my re uh, my re up because oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got to re up in July. Oh, yeah. Huh. So it's. Uh, huh. We don't hear much about it in the news. We don't. Once in a while, something will come up. Yeah, but, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps no news is good news in a way because generally. We get noticed when there's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. Like that plane right. and uh, a lost person. Uh -huh. Because I've been on two actual hunts for, uh, for lost people. Oh, yeah. On the, on the ground or in on the, the air? On the ground. On the ground. Yes. Huh. One, it was wet and sloppy and miserable. Yeah. And one of them, we ended up in a snowstorm. Oh, yeah. Up, uh, by Mount Lafayette. Huh. Because the kid had walked up over the mountain. Oh, yeah and uh, just disappeared. Huh. And the the other one was up uh, at an, an old people's home, and this guy didn't come in for his uh, afternoon ice cream at 4 o'clock. Oh, yeah. 
So they began to wonder, and uh, they searched for about four days and could not find him. And that was in the fall, and it was cold and damp and rainy when we were up there. Yeah. And uh, later on, they had a forester up there that was marking trees, and they found him seated beside a tree. Huh. And they figured that he had, you know, just wandered away. Yeah. Sat down and, and was dead upon sitting down. Oh, yeah. Huh. Because, of course, the Indians used to go off. Yeah. And when they got old, and not, and not yes. useful anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just sit down and huh. die. Yeah. And uh, whether this man had, you know, Indian blood in him or Indian ideas or what, but anyway, that's what happened. Yeah. Huh. And as I say, they they say he hadn't suffered. Yeah. Huh. Had, Come in. Oh, Bernice is here. Well, we're at Bernice. Oh, she brought my white geraniums. <laughs> oh. Good. Ah. Get me up to sit Yeah, we got you out of bed, did we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Whoops, you've got a knot in it. Uh-oh. Yeah. And this is a crazy thing that has got a twist in it. All right. So maybe I'll... I'll let you do it. See if I can. Oh, this is one of those things that I'm All not right. sure which way it goes. Now let's get reorganized here a little. Yeah, turn. Well, Bernice has joined us here, and uh, Bernice, we've been talking about the Civil Air Patrol. Good. Helen has been That's filling us in on that. interesting organization. It definitely is, and it saves the taxpayers a bit of money. I would think so. Well, from that uh, search for the plane a year ago at Christmas time mm -hmm. up here at Lebanon, mm -hmm. if, you had, if the government had paid the Civil Air Patrol people that were involved in that, would have broken the budget. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, they put in an awful lot of hours. Well, some people are still hunting for them. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. But the state had to give it up because they couldn't afford to. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I mean, it probably has been well over a million dollars spent on that. It, I wonder if they'll ever find it. Uh, I think they must have took off something. Helen was just saying that the box they had in the plane so you can find it wasn't in that plane. Somebody had taken it out. Oh. So it looks a little suspicious. Untraceable. Untra yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh. But again, as I was telling him about a plane that Rod helped hunt for, he and another man wanted to look in a certain place over in Vermont. And they said, no, the plane can't possibly be there. Five years later, the hunters found it in that spot, or in that area anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very tricky thing to hunt for a plane. Because now this time of year, a plane can go in and be totally under the trees, and you'd never oh, ever yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah. It leaves and you'd probably see where the tree knock, where the plane knocked the trees down before you'd see the you see. You might. You might. You yeah. might, but not always. Yeah. And sometimes it's only a broken branch that will tag it. Yeah, yeah. Because the the trees, the young stuff would pop back up. Yeah, yeah. In a few days. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Well, Bernice, how are you? Just fine, thank you. Good. I had a dentist appointment yesterday to get my teeth cleaned, and in order to do that, I had to get a prescription filled for antibiotics because of my knee operation. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, for heaven's sake, yes, yeah. huh. yes. But it's very important, I guess, because Ann Haya said she had an aunt who had a hip replacement, and she got infection oh, yeah. from going to the dentist. Huh. Well, when bone infection isn't funny either. No. Uh, not really. <clears throat> so not I've, really. I've got three more pills I've got to take today. But mm -hmm. I took one with breakfast. Ah, well, good girl. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take two before I went to the dentist. Yeah. Uh, did, did you have some things you wanted to share with us about your family? Oh, about my own family. Well, whatever you want. Yeah. Well, I went to see Conan yesterday after the dentist, and he was happy. He was doing well. Oh, good. His mind wanders a little. He said he'd been way up in the woods on one of those four-wheelers. Oh, yeah. oh. He had a wonderful time, and it was a beautiful pond up there. You oh, want to go up there, Mother? He said. <laughs> <laughs> huh. So if he can think like that sure. in, his, in his head, he's, yeah. he's happy because he used to love to walk in the woods. Yeah, great. <clears throat> and Stephen called this morning. Stephen, his wife, Beverly, live up in Bradford, Vermont, and he had some tires that 
second-hand tires he thought might fit my car. Oh, yeah. So he called, and he talked to Ronnie last night. Huh. And his, Beverly's younger daughter just got through her third year of college. Oh. And she's got all kinds of awards and scholarships and prizes, and she'll probably go to Ireland on her second semester next fall. Oh, yeah. Where's she going to school? Down in Massachusetts at oh, college. Yeah. yeah. Huh. And Nikki is all through college, and she's working at the White River Co-op. That's Beverly's other daughter? Manager. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they both oh. love Steve, so it's, yeah. it's oh, wonderful. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. He's happy. He's, yeah. That's what counts. <laughs> huh. Good. Yeah. And uh, Beth, I took Beth to the doctor for her Meniere's disease yeah. last, last week, and uh, he told her about a Dr. Johnson up at Hitchcock that has used this new medicine that they've just discovered by uh -huh. research. But it was used on a very elderly lady and it didn't work, but he thought it might work on somebody younger. But he told her to be a detective for a month or so and not eat any milk products or yeah. change change her diet and see if that had anything to do with her ear problems, oh, yeah. her dizziness. Yeah. Huh. But she's feeling a little better, she said. Yeah. She can function on, I mean, she can walk around. Yeah, yeah, she's working. Yeah. It just hits her all of a sudden when it comes. Oh, yeah. And she just has to go to bed. And yeah. She can't even walk when it hits her. No, oh, yeah. Well, how do they get her home then? One person on each side of her? Well, they take her home the car. No, but I was thinking of getting her out of the building. Oh, well, they they walk her out, mm -hmm. take hold of her arm. Yeah. But it's happened when she was grocery shopping and she couldn't even pay for her groceries. Oh, so yeah. they had to help her get into the car. And huh. It's a, not a very nice disease. No. No, not She's had enough other problems with her diabetes, and but the doctor said it was more likely to hit people with diabetes. Yeah. Oh, others. interesting. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Now diabetes is such a devil of a disease. Mm -hmm. She's a lucky girl to have cancer, and she hasn't had any re relapse of that, mm -hmm. so that's good. Yeah. Oh. And. I haven't heard much from California lately, but Bruce and Chris and the two boys are doing fine. Jared graduates from high school this next month. Now he's he's going to be an occupational therapist. Is uh -huh. that what his yeah, that's what role he's is? Doing. He's had three years of pre med in, oh, yeah. in high school. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I wish they would do that back here in the east. They do it in Florida. Yeah, you? they do. Yeah, I think you can do that. You have options, college degree options in high school. I do at Hartford anyway. Oh. If you know, if you know what you oh, want to do, they do up yeah, here in Hartford? you can get several. Good. You can get started on your college credits in high uh -huh. school if you want to work at it. For doctoring too. For anything, yeah, mm -hmm. anything. You have extra time. Yeah, because I mean, your sciences in high school would would count. Yeah. I mean, if you took uh, uh, chemistry and yeah. and physics. I think you can even go. To a, not like to Dartmouth. If you're going to go to Dartmouth, you can go take some classes during the high school time. And oh, hey. There's some different options. Give you different credits. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So what's Bruce's other boy? He's younger. Yeah, he's 15, 16 now. Huh. 15. He's doing well in school, and he's into sports and yeah. everything. He, I, he hasn't made up his mind what he wants to do. Yeah. Well, a lot of us are that way. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Wonder all your life what you're going to do with yourself. <laughs> well, you have to keep trying this and that to right. see what fits you. I did the cemeteries last Saturday afternoon because Monday was the federal memorial. You mean day. you put flowers on them? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Both in the Johnson and Childs and yeah. the Fitches down at Chase. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wondered if I should go cover them last night because yeah. they said we'd have a frost. But we didn't have one. Did you have a frost? Not quite. I don't mm -hmm. think it was in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a. I had just brought my house plants downstairs that had been upstairs all winter. Oh yeah. <laughs> Put them outdoors, so I covered those up last night. Yeah. The rest were hardy enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. mine had been out for 
almost two weeks. So mine, I just and got them out. So, so I think they <laughs> were all right. I haven't been mm -hmm. out at, at them this morning, and I brought home uh, four tomato plants and a couple of um, um, eggplant from Connecticut. Oh, when I came back last night, hmm. and I laid them out here by the side of the house, so I think they'll be all right. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, after I got the cemetery done down at Chase, you know, I went over to Ronnie and Dorothy's. She was babysitting a little girl, and then there was a little boy there that I don't know where he came from. <laughs> She's got a new horse that was given to her. Oh, Dorothy does? Mm. Ronnie's wife? Yeah. Great big male horse. Huh. Beautiful. Gonna, got a lot of energy in that. Yeah. <laughs> Huh. Does she ride it? He's got a saddle and all ready to go? She's, she's going to. Yeah. Huh. Oh, good. She was taking him out just to give him a little green grass because he'd never had green grass before. Oh, just yeah. Hay huh. You only want to give him a little in the beginning. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> <laughs> she was taking him out once a day and then twice a day, and now she told yeah. Ronnie she thought he was ready for three times a day for a little bit of grass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. and then oh, good. After, after a while, they'll put him out in the pasture. They've got such a great place to ride. Yeah. I know it's seven miles, seven miles of trails. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Wonderful. Yeah. That's at Philip Burlings. Yeah. Like yeah. Caretaking for Philip Burlings. Yeah. And they've got two other horses that they're just keeping. Oh yeah. For the summer. Yeah. They've got one cow. One milk cow and yeah. a calf yeah. and a goat. They got a goat too. Bunch of pigs. <laughs> oh, a whole lot of pigs. Yeah. There were two little cute ones that he bought that were sleeping underneath the ramp that went up into the barn. <laughs> huh. And the little girl would go over there and stoop down and look at her. Oh, yeah. Huh. yeah, I took I took my children over. I took Corey over with a friend. And yeah. the pigs were just little babies and they'd get in there with them. And it it's was so fun. sweet. Yeah. Most huh. Any babies are cute, but <laughs> <laughs> pigs are really wonderful. Huh. And they're so smart. Yeah. You can train them beautifully. And how's Robin and Mike doing? Well, Doing fine. Um, she's gardening to beat the cars. Yeah, still caretaking the quinos. Yes, they were. I went up the other day and they were. Josh and Mike were taking down all the storm windows. Oh yeah, that's on the big stone house. Washing the windows. Yeah. Yes, the quinos. Huh. They've been gone for a couple of days and then they're going to go to Ireland for a month. Oh yeah. When they get back from. I don't know. I guess they're down to Josie's or somewhere. Oh, the quinos are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Robin has a big vegetable garden, and yeah. their cow, Valerie, that they've had for seven or eight years now, she's had her calf. This is a milk cow? Or they got a milk cow? No, it's a Hereford. Cow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a Hereford. Huh. Had a little heifer yeah. born on Don Manette's birth, so they named the calf Don, D-A-W-N. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how old it is, so. Yeah. When it was born. Huh. That's good. She has a large garden, a lot of stuff planted, yeah. plus flowers. She's, huh. She has to go over and tend to Joan Quinault's gardens too, you know. Yeah. She was mowing the lawn when I went up there. I don't know how she does it all. No, she just keeps busy. Yeah. Makes a good job for her right there at home. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the wonderful part about it, she's home with the boys. Yes. And yeah. She's she's earning money, but the boys are right there too, and she knows where they are and what they're doing. Be there when they come home from school. Oh yeah. Something she, to talk about. She doesn't earn any money except that their rent is free, but they don't get paid any time. Right. Oh. Well, that's quite a deal. Yeah, it is today. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, if it's uh, a rent like that, would be five hundred dollars a month. Five hundred. Listen, girl. When Ronnie and Dorothy came back from California, it was six hundred, and now it's eight hundred. Yeah, they tried to, to rent a house. It's eight hundred dollars. Whoa! Yeah, that's money. Yeah, that's money. Great grief! I I couldn't have gone out and rented a house no. when I was working. No, that's two hundred dollars a week. No, yes, <laughs> yes, and I was bringing home a hundred. Yeah, that wouldn't work too good. <laughs> when I was working in Washington for the Congressman, I thought I was doing well. I got two hundred and fifty dollars a month. Yeah. <laughs> that was back in the forties. Yeah. Well, you didn't pay three dollars for a loaf of bread either. <laughs> no, right. That's right. Yeah. And what was your rent? Maybe uh, 
I've forgotten how much. Forty dollars a for month. Them. I've forgotten how much I did pay for my room. I know my folks used to get twenty-five dollars a week for the apartment when I was little. Uh huh. So that was probably they'd pay a hundred dollars a month. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, when when we were living in Hartford back in the forties, uh, we were paying forty dollars a month rent for a three-room apartment. Uh -huh. Oh, well, this was I just had a room. I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. So probably more like twenty-five. Yeah. I can't remember for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Because when I first went to Hartford, if I'd gone to work in the uh, insurance companies, the girls were getting eight or ten dollars a week, and I'd have had to pay eight dollars a week for a room. Oh yeah. So I couldn't afford to work in the insurance companies. Hmm. But things have changed. Yeah. Be but most of the girls that worked there lived at home. They expected the family to support them when they got to be old enough to go to work. Hey. Huh. Things have changed. Things have changed. But uh, this weekend, or leaving Sunday morning, Rodney, my oldest son, took me down to uh, Connecticut to visit some of his cousins on the Lovell side. And then we uh, also went across the state and uh, visited the man who was little boy next door when we lived in Manchester. And so that was great to see them again. And his uh, youngest daughter is being married on the 6th. Oh, yeah. Uh, down there in Manchester. Huh. And uh, well, good. Irvin and Marilyn and I are planning on oh, going, going back, back down. Oh, oh good. yes, we're going down. <laughs> Boy, you're a gad. <laughs> you ain't a kid, I'm a gad. Hey, <laughs> what am I going to do? Might as well keep going. <laughs> I'm not going to sit home and whimper and whine. There's nothing to do. I am so bored. Oh, no. I've heard that from some people. Oh. I'm so lonesome. Marion is moving back to Claremont again. Oh, she is. She's, she's so lonesome. Yeah. Oh, really? Huh. I live alone, but I'm not lonesome. Yeah, you keep busy, too. You don't have time to be lonesome. <clears throat> yeah. I know it. And, of course, you're planning on going back to work. And, uh, Are you working at St. Gardens now? Have you started? Tomorrow. Well, I'm supposed to today, but I have a doctor's appointment. Let me see. So tomorrow. So you'll be still <coughs> selling the books in the, mm -hmm. the bookstore. In the, in the, the store, yeah. Yeah. There's a lady from Charlestown who's going to work four afternoons a week this year, and I'm going to work three. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can cut it down to two if I want. So, yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <coughs> they wanted me to work full time because I sold so much last year. Oh, yeah. But yeah. you've got to have a life besides yeah. that. Well, the kids have been after me for several years to slow down. And yeah. when I got to be 78, I thought, well, maybe it's time I did slow down a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to have as big a vegetable garden. And, but I keep adding more flowers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> more of this, more of that. Oh, that's fine. Planted more asparagus roots a couple of years ago. And yeah. How about your fruit trees? How did they do this through the winter? Did they? They blossomed. Yeah. But uh, we don't have any bees. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it was very strange yeah. this year. You it, did not hear. You did not see bees. Yeah, no. I've seen one honeybee all spring. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I've I seen. Saw I've seen yeah. bumblebees. All yeah, the I've seen a few. But no honeybees. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who prunes apple trees and picks apples, and he said there's. There's a lot of little bees that are so small you can't see them. The wild bees are mm -hmm. real small, and what? unless you really knew how to look for them, you wouldn't see them. Oh, really? And they do a lot of pollinating. He wasn't really concerned about pollination. Oh. Because he, he thought there were enough of those little wild bees around that were... Uh-huh. Well, maybe I will have some, but I haven't noticed them. Yeah. That. I'd never heard of that. I oh. hadn't either. Yeah. But uh, with the one pear tree I have, I don't have a second one. Because well, my I second just... one didn't live. Oh, I had yeah. three plum trees. I had four at one point. Right now I've just got one, so and that was just full of blossoms. It is every year, standing plum. Mm -hmm. huh. But I won't get any plums yeah. because of that. You have to have cross pollination between two mm -hmm. varieties. Well the mm -hmm. same with the pear tree. Yeah. I've got four pear trees. Yeah. Got a peck of pears off in one year and that's the most I ever got. Yeah. Oh, one year I had pears like you wouldn't believe. I bet I had two bushel off that tree. Mm -hmm. We haven't had good pears for several years. Dad used to have good pears. I know. I we used to get a lot of them. Hmm. I, don't know what, I don't know what 
what I'm doing different. <laughs> One of my boys uh, doesn't want pears because I fed him too many from your mother's. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I hope to have a lot of blackberries and quite a few raspberries. My yeah. blueberries have all died right now. Oh, yeah? I've got blueberries and they're blossoming like crazy. And I mean <laughs> blueberries. They'll stack in another month, right? And blueberries get to the end of June? Or? No, no. Not that early? End of July. Oh, yeah. They probably be just about starting when I uh, leave in July for the last week. Mm. Because one year I was able to pick a quarter and a half before I left, and that was it. Hmm. And uh, last year... Last year you picked a lot? Yes, I was able to pick some before I left because uh, I went down to Graymore later. Oh. It was in August because the National Mm -hmm. Church had their uh, th uh, three-year convention. So this is a church convention at Graymoor, New no, York? No, no. At Graymoor, uh, we, uh, the brothers and sisters of St. Gregory meet once a year, uh, well, twice a year, uh -huh. and uh, generally for five days, six days. Where is Graymoor? Graymoor is in Garrison, New York, which is across the river from West Point. Oh. So it's it's down the Hudson oh, Way, yeah. but it's it's a decent travel yeah. to get there. Yeah. There's one little spot uh, where 84 crosses 9 that can be very congested. Oh. But uh, I don't go through Poughkeepsie anymore because that's that's a hard drive from down on 9 because you start out with six lanes of traffic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the time you get down to uh, Garrison, it's down to one, uh, you know, to a, just a two-lane road, hmm. so it's quite different. Yeah. But uh, I found a, a back way to get there, so I don't have to buck the six-lane traffic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Good. Oh yes. More comfortable. <laughs> More comfortable for me. Yeah. Although I did drive uh, back from uh, the rest stop at uh, the where Vermont and Massachusetts meet. There's a rest stop down there on 91, yeah. and I drove from there home yesterday afternoon. Oh, you did? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Driving uh, Cindy's car. <laughs> Rod's car isn't good enough to make the trip, so Cindy let him oh, have yeah. her little sports car. Uh-huh. That's his daughter? That's his youngest daughter that's getting married. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yes, it was yeah. It was quite a car. And, well, he going down, he was getting awful tired, and when we got into Winstead, I, I drove the rest of the way over to Sharon. Yeah. But it's I don't think you've told us about your sons, have you? No, I haven't told so much. Well, Rodney works uh, on mail contract. He's your oldest son. He's the oldest, and he's the one that took me to Connecticut this weekend. But um, he has three daughters. When he, uh, when uh, his youngest brother was born, he was very upset because it wasn't his sister. <laughs> so every once in a while now I, I tease him because he has three little girls. <laughs> which are not little anymore. One of them is married, one of them is getting married <laughs> very shortly, and uh, the other one that has cystic fibrosis is doing very well, and she's living in Florida and got a good job and uh, doing well down there. Huh. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, huh. yes, because a girl with cystic fibrosis is better off than a boy. Oh, really? Yes, yes. But I wonder what the difference would be. I don't know. Well, of course, she isn't as bad a cystic as many. Oh, not like uh, Robert Hilliard's daughter. No, she died from. Uh, oh, she did. Yeah. Oh yes, oh. and there was a, a little girl in Heartland that they were trying to get volunteers to come in and help her at noontime for the breathing, and she died before they could get it set up mm. because she was just, you know, starting school or second grade or something or other. Mm. And yeah. But no, there's quite a difference in degree mm. of illness with yeah, that. Yeah. But uh, Paula has done very well. Mm. But they they had put her on a very very strict diet, and she wasn't gaining. She wasn't. I mean, this is when she was tiny. Yeah. Maybe three years old, and hey, she wasn't doing well. And the mother said, "Hey, let her eat what she wants." Ah. And she did. And thrived, right. and even played soccer in school. Oh my goodness! Huh. Oh yes, 
Yes, it, it was. It was interesting. How about Byron? He's Byron's in uh, Odenton, Maryland. He works for the uh, government at uh, Fort Meade. His wife has just retired from the government service. Yeah. And she's got uh, multiple sclerosis. Huh. And well, she's hanging in there now, and her eyes are. Uh, it was the first indication of it, but now she frequently carries a cane. Oh yeah. And uh, Byron is not well. He's had a heart attack. He's had a stroke. He still keeps working, but I don't know. Oh. I don't know. He and he's very much overweight. That doesn't help. No. Any, any disease. Yeah. Doesn't no, help. it doesn't help. Yeah. But. <clears throat> Well, at one time he had lost considerable weight. He had his pants all taken in, mm. and then he started it and gained all the weight back again. So when his son got married, I had to take the take pants, back out. <laughs> take the pants and, and let them out just as far as they would go. Yeah, but it's it's pathetic. Huh. It's pathetic for any person to be that heavy. Huh. And Frank lives in Manchester. He's New the Hampshire. youngest son. He's the youngest. He's married. And he's got two children. His uh, daughter got married last fall and is going to have a baby come fall again. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, his son works two jobs. He started in high school working for Alexander's, which is a uh, uh, grocery store. And then he wanted to get into the uh, post office. And he's had a, he's worked. Uh, you know, your Christmas rush, yeah. and there was a, a time limit that you could work, and then there was a time limit before you could go back to work again, but he's over that. He's on full time, but not to the point where he is permanent. permanent. Oh, yeah. But uh, he's hmm. expecting to, to be made permanent. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Postal worker. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Why don't you shut that off while I see what's going on? Okay. The one thing more that I wanted to speak about personally is uh, my involvement with the uh, Episcopal Church, because I've been a, a licensed lay reader since 1970, and I had I've been in the missions in Virginia before I was married, and so I've stayed very much involved in the church. And uh, after Rod died, I needed something. And I had known two of the brothers in the Brotherhood of St. Gregory. And then one day I got a, a note that they were having a uh, uh, vocations day over in La Laconia. So I went over. And it seemed to be something that would be good for me. And so. Uh, uh, their, a sisterhood had started as companion sisters to the brothers, and uh, so I went for it. And uh, now I'm an annually professed sister, and the sisters are uh, going very shortly to be on their own, uh, not, you know, being part of the brotherhood. So it's, it's going to be interesting when we break away, because some of the brothers have never known it without the sisters, oh, yeah. and of course the sisters have always been involved with the brothers, so it's, it's going to be quite interesting, but it's been such a blessing to me, and so I am very glad to have, to be part of it and uh, continue with it, so that other people are involved in their churches, and Bernie here is very much involved in the church at Cornish Center. <laughs> I was typing like crazy <clears throat> when I got home yesterday because I had to do the annual report for the trustees. I had to do two different flower committee reports and do the nominating committee report. Then I got them all typed up before the Bible study last night. Uh -huh. <laughs> to come down. So uh -huh. she sat down and, and did what she was supposed to. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I was, uh, soon after I was married the next year, I was put in as town clerk. 
and I was town clerk for two years, and then I got pregnant the second time, I decided not to refile. And Avis McMillan was town clerk for the next 21 years. And then in 1971, I took it over again because she went to Florida, and they dumped everything that concerned the town in my kitchen. So I had <laughs> town clerk office in the corner of my kitchen. And uh, so then I was town clerk for the next 17 years. And I was still town clerk down in the old jail, which was in back of the selectman's office beside the library. And uh, Abby Dean had passed away from cancer. And then Bernice, Harold Dean's sister, came and lived with him. And then she finally died over at Barrow's Nursing Home in North Cornish from cancer. And uh, Harold was living alone, and I used to get his mail for him every day. And I'd go to the store and get a quarter pound of Hamburg or a can of this or that for him when he needed food. And then I noticed that he wasn't feeling well, and he kept getting worse, and he said, oh, it was just a grip. He wouldn't tell me what ailed him. What, what, what year was this? What, do you oh, remember? No, I don't remember the year. Would it have been the 70s? No, 80s probably. In the 80s? Early 80s. Yeah. Uh, he finally got so bad he couldn't get out of the chair to come to the door when I went, when I knocked. So I would go in, he'd holler and I'd go in and, and I knew he was getting very ill and so I asked him if a visiting nurse could come and check him over and he said yes and I was very surprised because of his, the way he was. But the visiting nurse came and said he had, uh, she came down to the office and told me he had running ulcer sores on both legs and he was a mess. And so I told her to go get Conan, and Conan took him up to Veterans Hospital in the pickup truck. Well, he was there quite a while, and we went up to see him, and, and uh, finally the hospital called us and said that he was ready to be discharged, but he wouldn't go anywhere they suggested, the soldier's home or any of the nursing homes. And they finally asked him where he was going, and he said he was going to Johnson's. And they asked us if we had invited him, and we said no. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to do, they said. And uh, so we talked about it, and Conan had answered the phone, so he finally said to, that we would take him. So that meant we had, to, I said, we'd have to move our bedroom upstairs, and Conan said, no way. That wasn't the way he said it, but anyway. <laughs> 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 he wasn't going to move upstairs, so... I said Harold couldn't go up and down stairs, so I told them they, he and the boys had their work cut out for them. And we had a back kitchen at that time that was open up into the attic and open out into the woodshed. And it, in two weeks, we had renovated that room, insulated, put in new ceiling, new, bought new doors, put in linoleum and carpeting, and bought a second-hand refrigerator and went down to his house because we had the keys and brought up the best bed that was down there and tables and chests, you know, different things. Yeah. And Stephen bought a recliner for him because he was supposed to keep his feet up. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, the day he moved in from the hospital, we were just connecting the gas stove so he could have plenty of heat. So he had his own heat in that room. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we bought a second-hand refrigerator so he could keep ice cream and sodas, whatever he wanted, yeah. like that out there. Yeah. But he had to use our bathroom, and <laughs> every single day I was trying to clean my kitchen. I'd want to sweep and mop, and I would just get... I'd wait until he had gone to the bathroom, gone back out to his room, and taken his pill, everything. I thought, well, now I can do the floor. <laughs> every, it never failed. Every time I got halfway through, <laughs> or I was waxing it or something, he'd come shuffling out in his slippers. <laughs> <laughs> I was so afraid he'd fall down or something. Yeah. You know. He was he was a very eccentric person. He was a mathematician. He was a very smart mathematician, and he could do anything with tools. He had all kinds of tools down at the other house, and he brought some of them up there. And uh, 
he could fix things. He fixed my donut maker that I had, you know, with, with pieces of copper around it so they wouldn't wear out when you screwed the knob on and so oh, forth, yeah. and things like that. <clears throat> Very clever, but he wouldn't ever use a telephone. And uh, before he came to our house, when he lived down in his own house, which was next door to ours, he used to uh, stop the gas fire down to Slickman's office for them and supposed to clean up the room a little. And whenever they were getting out of gas, he'd come up to the house and ask me to call the gas company and order gas. He would not use the telephone. Huh. And when any of his relatives called, which wasn't very often, he wouldn't talk to them. He had a nephew that wanted to borrow his sextant that they had. He bought a beautiful sextant, and then he had fixed it better, made it even more accurate and so yeah. forth. And uh, he wouldn't let his nephew borrow it. Well, then his nephew called again later and wanted to buy it from him. Nope. He wouldn't sell that nephew anything. <laughs> well, then when Haroldine died at the hospital Thanksgiving morning, everything went to this nephew, grandnephew. Oh, he got it anyway. He yeah. got it anyway. Huh. Did he leave it in his will, or was that his first nope. living relative? We never. We looked in his room, and we couldn't find any will. And uh, the grandnephew came and just cleared everything out of his house. Opened the windows and threw everything out into the truck. And if there was a will, he didn't make it known. Oh, yeah. Huh. And I asked him. I kind of wanted something that was Abby's, just to remember them by, because yeah. they had been wonderful neighbors, you know. And, and uh, he said everything was going to the dump because it was water soaked. Huh. Oh. And then I found out from Charlie Hutchin that he had had three or four different yard sales. Beautiful rocking chair that Abby had up in the guest bedroom. Charlie Hutchin bought that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh. So he didn't throw anything away. Oh, yeah. He got money out of the whole thing. Huh. Plus he got to sext it. Yeah. But Harold Dean had a niece, you know, Sybil, Sybil Gordon Packers. Hmm. And she wasn't involved at all. Oh, yeah. So doesn't the state take over or something if there's no will? And I thought so, but... That just kind of went under the wayside, huh? I guess. Huh. So Harold lived with you for six years? For just about almost six years. Yeah. Hmm. I thought once I... I had to uh, treat his ulcer sores that were still active three times a day when he first came. And uh, then they were getting better and twice a day and then yeah. once a day. You know, uh, and yeah. Finally his legs healed up. Yeah. And I thought then he would go back home, but he didn't want to. Yeah. He was pretty comfortable there. He, at that was, point. he was comfortable. He yeah. got his three meals a day and he loved desserts. He wanted dessert at noon and night both and we only had dessert Sunday ordinarily. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was kept busy making pies and cakes and puddings and huh. cookies and so forth. Yeah. Donuts, he loved donuts. But he could always make better donuts than I. And if I made fudge, he could make better fudge than I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was quite a guy. And the corn, cornbread. <laughs> he told about his mother's cornbread. Oh, you could bend it, he said. <laughs> oh! <laughs> there was different kinds of corn. You had to use the right kind of corn. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Manette, he was courting Robin at the time when Harold was living with us. <laughs> Michael can copy him beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> he remembers some of the things Harold is always saying. <laughs> well, this has been a real education for me, talking to you ladies. <laughs> well, it's been fun. I'm glad that we get this opportunity. It's mm -hmm. great. It's and, great. Uh, oh, there's one thing before you finish okay. I want to say. All right. If it wasn't for your father, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Orville has been so great in coming down and helping put the fence around the garden to keep the woodchucks out and uh, uh, checking my house when when you haven't, Jim. Uh, I haven't been Christmas, going much lately. But. Christmas time when I've been gone. Well, it was a couple of three years you yeah, did. Yeah. And uh, this winter when I had the broken shoulder, 
Your father came for two and a half weeks every day to pick up my mail at the end of the driveway and bring it up to the house. Even when the mud was up to the hub? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he didn't know whether he'd make it or not, he said someday. I know, but he insisted on coming and bringing my mail up. Yeah, that's good. It's nice. Oh, I tell you, it's, it's been fantastic. It gives him something to do. Well, I'd yeah. like to I'd like to interview him, but he didn't want to be interviewed. Oh, yeah. I thought he might with Mike Ratzevich when I did Mike, but... Oh. Oh. It's too bad because, I mean, there must be so much that he remembers. Yeah, I'll get after him a little. Okay. <laughs> he, he does for so many people. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Yes, in fact, he's mowing the lawn this morning and then he's going to come in, uh, before lunchtime and uh, put in my uh, pole bean bowl, poles. Oh, my goodness. So that uh, I can have my pole beans because he's already got the fence up around the garden. Yeah. And, uh, so it's great. Okay, now, All right. you, now you can close. Oh, thank you. <laughs>